Good morning. It's time for class to start. We have a couple of announcements to make. One is the uh, the Bible reading encourager where the children are reading. Uh, they're going to be reading through the book of Matthew over the next nine weeks. And this was passed around last week, but we'll pass it around again as far as being an encourager to one of those children. So if you're interested in that, please sign up, and uh, you'll hear more about that as far as who to uh, encourage and go from there. And then also next Saturday morning at 9 o'clock is the men's breakfast. Now, I'm sure we're going to have a really healthy breakfast if it's just the men here with probably donuts. <laughs> but, but I'll be passing this around along with our prayer request. Kip Morthew will be leading us in our closing prayer. Let's have a word of, of prayer, and then we will. Blessed Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you for the many blessings you've given us, Father. And, Father, we especially thank you for this privilege we have of being here to hear your precious word proclaimed, Father. Father, please watch over us this day and always. We'll always strive to do your blessed will, Father, and that your will and not our will will be done in our lives. We ask this in Christ, our blessed Savior's name, Father. Amen. Good morning. I think I had five minutes carried over from the last lesson, didn't I? I thought I had five minutes. You don't carry over. Oh man, you, you deduct it. Okay, it's like a, it's like a government program. If you don't spend it, you lose it. It's good to be back. We were last week. We were with worshiping with the congregation in Wills Point, east of Dallas. And then talking to them about the sunset and about senior aim. And we had planned on coming back on Monday, and we looked at the weather and saw what was going to happen to Dallas that day. So luckily, we headed back on Sunday afternoon and made it back here before the storm hit. A couple of prayer requests that might be a little bit too long to put on the sheet. Uh, Amy's brother-in-law, Walt, died the Friday of the workshop. And so we're going to be leaving on Thursday, flying out on Thursday to go to, to Ohio to attend that that funeral so appreciate your prayers for the family and and for our flight another sister mary is uh, on palliative care and she's pretty much stopped eating and having trouble uh, breathing and so we have that going on too in the family so appreciate your your prayers for the family we've talked about uh, folly we've talked about wisdom we've talked about wealth and money and we've talked about anger and hatred and today we're going to take a look at the tongue now which of these is important yes yes the the senior aim students have learned that when i say is it this or that and it's both they just say yes and there's no way to go through this list and say one is more important than the other which one's the hardest yep Wisdom, folly, wealth and money, anger and hatred, or what about the tongue? What about how we use the tongue? Every one of these applies to us, but in some ways the tongue seems to present a, a special challenge, doesn't it? When we talk about the tongue, we're talking about our lips or our mouth or our words or our speech or our talk. There are a lot of words we could use to, to express that same idea. But that's what we mean when we're talking about the tongue. And Proverbs warns us that the tongue has the power of life and death. Those who love it will eat its fruit. Now, as you saw in that picture, sometimes the best thing to do with our tongue and our mouth is just keep it closed, right? Proverbs 11.12 says, A man who lacks judgment derides his neighbor but a man of understanding holds his tongue in chapter 17 verse 28 it says even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue you've heard that one it's better to to uh, keep your mouth shut and let everybody think you're a fool than open your mouth and prove it 
And so people think you're wise if you keep your mouth closed. It's when you open your mouth that they might really guess what the situation is. And verse 20, 23, he who guards his mouth and his tongue keeps himself from calamity. So in, in some ways, keeping our mouth shut is going to be the best way to deal with our tongue. Uh, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, let your oh no, and anything beyond these is, of, is evil. And there, of course, he's, taking, he's talking about taking an oath. You've probably known people who, who will start talking and say, now I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. <laughs> Which makes you wonder what they're doing the rest of the time when they don't have to say, now you can believe me now because I'm not lying now. What I was telling you before probably is questionable. And that's what Jesus is saying. When we talk, when we open our mouths as Christians, no matter what it is, we need to make sure that what we're saying is true and that the truth comes out. James says it this way, But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. You remember what James says in, in chapter 3, that let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we shall incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. And James goes on there in, in chapter 3 with some very important advice about how difficult it is to, to uh, control our tongue. Just as a rudder controls the whole ship, our mouth controls us. And we need to learn how to control our mouth if we want to control ourselves. Proverbs 18, 6 and 7 says, A fool's lips bring him strife, and his mouth invites a beating. A fool's mouth is his undoing, and his lips are a snare to his soul. I hope you've never had that temptation with when a fool is speaking just to punch him right in the mouth. But the, the proverb says that uh, his mouth invites a beating. Uh, we, won't, we won't do it. We won't carry it out. But sometimes it just, that's all it deserves is a slap in the face or a punch in the mouth and you've probably known people like that in your life that that uh, be better if they would keep their mouth shut because when they open their mouth they're inviting a, a beating but proverbs 11 or 12 14 says from the fruit of his lips a man is filled with good things as surely as the work of his hands reward him i have to confess that when i first started thinking about this lesson i was thinking about the things that we should not do with our lips, that we should not do this and we should not do that. But thanks to the, the information that was in the preparation for the teachers and even things that we heard at the workshop, I came to realize that that's really not the whole picture because Proverbs does not just tell us what not to do with our lips, but it also tells us what to do with our lips. It's not a negative lesson. And if we just shut our mouths and put tape over our mouths, we've missed the whole point. Because it's not not doing something, it is what you do in its place. And so we notice that the book of Proverbs has a lot positive to say about our tongue and how we use our tongue. And so by the fruit of his lips, a man is filled with good things. As surely as the work of his hands reward him. There are some negative things that we need to learn from the book of Proverbs and from other places in the, in the Bible. Proverbs talks about a perverse tongue. Chapter 6 verse 12 says a scoundrel and a villain who goes about with a corrupt mouth or the New American Standard says a perverse mouth. Proverbs 19.1 says better a poor man whose walk is blameless than a fool whose lips are perverse. But I had to find out what that word perverse means. What, what is he talking about when he says a perverse tongue? And Strong's Dictionary describes it as distorted False, crooked, froward, perverse. It's like a knot, something that's been made crooked or something that's been all tied up. But I wasn't sure what froward meant either. <laughs> so I had to go to the internet to vocabulary.com and find out what it meant by froward. And it means willful and disobedient. If your dog sits when you call her to come and runs away when you call her to tell her to sit, she's froward. <laughs> that's what froward means. Habitually disposed to disobedience and opposition. Some of the synonyms are headstrong, 
self-willed, willful, disobedient, not obeying or complying with commands of those in authority. And I actually learned that froward is the opposite of toward. Toward means you come toward, and froward means you don't come toward, you go the other direction. And that is what a, pers- a perverse tongue is. A perverse tongue is one that goes in the wrong direction. In Proverbs 4.24, it says, Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put devious lips from you. And notice all those things it says about our mouth and about our tongues and our lips. Perverse, corrupt, deceitful, devious. And so I looked up corrupt and devious. And it means to turn aside, to depart to be froward. I'm glad I knew what that word meant before I ran across it. Perverse, properly to twine, that is by implication, to unite. And I think that that a corrupt tongue unites us in the wrong way with the wrong things because it is turning in the wrong direction. Proverbs warns against tongues that are tempting or evil or malicious. In fact, that's a good part of the the early part of Proverbs where it talks about uh, wisdom and folly and presents them as two women. And wisdom is this beautiful woman, and folly is that evil temptress. And so Proverbs 5.3 says, For the lips of the adulteress drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. That's tempting. That is evil. That is malicious. And as you know, Satan is not going to show up as a little man in a red suit with, with the horns and a forked tail and a pitchfork. He is going to show up as something warm and fuzzy. He's going to show up as a cute little puppy or something else. And that's how he's going to present himself. And that's how Folly presents herself as an adulteress whose lips drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. Proverbs 17.4 says, A wicked man listens to evil lips. A liar pays attention to a malicious tongue. I have to keep looking these words up to make sure I know what they mean. And as it's used in the, in the Bible, malicious, or the New American Standard, destructive, in the sense of eagerly coveting and rushing upon by implication of falling, of ruin, calamity, iniquity, mischief, naughtiness, naughty, noisome, perverse, and very wickedness. I don't see anything in that list that we'd want to have. I don't see anything in that list that is good for us. And so that tempting, evil, malicious tongue is leading us toward calamity and toward things that are not right. Proverbs 24, the first two verses, warn, do not envy wicked men, do not desire their company, for their hearts plot violence and their lips talk about making trouble. In the next chapter, Proverbs 25 and verse 23, it says, as the north wind brings rain, So a sly tongue brings angry looks. And chapter 26, verse 24 says, A malicious man disguises himself with his lips, but in his heart he harbors deceit. And as I was reading that, I couldn't help but think of the first chapter of of the Psalms. If you want to look at Psalm 1 and see what it says there about the companions that some people choose, it's a good example of what we're talking about when we talk about an evil or a malicious or a tempting tongue. And it must be chapter 2 because chapter 1 doesn't have 16 verses. <laughs> if, you can, if you can start with verse 8 in chapter 1, let me know. But we should read the first, the first verse there. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. I wonder if it was Proverbs that I wanted. Was it Proverbs that I wanted in chapter 1? I bet it is. It was Proverbs. 
It says, we saw in Psalms that it told us that, that it's wonderful to walk in the path of the Lord. The other side is here in, in Proverbs 1, where it says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are a gross, graceful wrath to your head and ornaments about your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol, even whole, as those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious wealth. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Throw in your lot with us. We shall all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their path. For their feet run to evil, and they hasten to shed blood. That is tempting, evil, malicious talk, where they say, why don't you join with us? We'll go do something fun. We'll do something. We'll make some ill-gotten gain. It'll be easy. It won't cost us anything. And that's the kind of temptation that comes through evil and malicious tongues. Several of these passages in Proverbs talk about a, a lying tongue, and it's often used in combination with other things. But one place where it talks about a lying tongue is in uh, chapter 21, verse 6. It says, A fortune made by lying tongue is a fleeting vapor and a deadly snare. I wonder if Bernie Madoff would say the same thing today. <laughs> that a fortune made by lying tongue is a fleeting vapor and a deadly snare. Ill-gotten gain is not going to do us any good. And a lot of times that's done with a flattering tongue, a, a, a sharp tongue that entices us, but it's all a lie. And a lying tongue is not going to end up in a good place. Proverbs chapter 6 lists seven things that the Lord hates. There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil. A false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among his brothers. And notice that at least three of those are fueled by the tongue. The lying tongue is obvious, and lest we not understand how God feels about a lying tongue, he hates it. God hates a lying tongue. But a false witness who utters lies, that's the tongue. And one who spreads strife among brothers usually does it with gossip and slander and with the tongue. God has no use for a lying tongue. He has no use for a, a slandering tongue. And slander is to speak ill of, of someone else. And often slander is something that's false. And we're spreading falsehood. And Proverbs 24, 28 says, Do not testify against your neighbor without cause, or use your lips to deceive. Perhaps on the other end of that spectrum, and just as bad as a flattering tongue. Now, we're not talking about paying someone a compliment. Uh, we, need to, we need to compliment people, and we need to encourage people and pat them on the back. But that's not what flattering is. Flattering is fake. Flattering is trying to butter somebody up, and it's trying to, to get something out of them quite often. And a flattering tongue is not okay. Proverbs 26, 28 says, A lying tongue hates those it hurts, and a flattering mouth works ruin. And Proverbs 28, 23 says, He who rebukes a man will in the end gain more favor than he who has a flattering tongue. Sincere correction. Uh, sincere instruction, helping somebody who might need some help if it's done for the right purpose in the right way is beneficial. <coughs> but a flattering tongue is, is detrimental. It's better to, to say something that, that may not be real pleasant, but if you do it with the right kind of attitude, it's going to profit a whole lot more than flattering somebody and causing that kind of destruction. The Proverbs are, in some places, are made up of two statements opposite statements and I put a couple of stacks of these sheets out in the foyer on a couple of tables so if you want to pick one up on the way way out and take a look at it a little bit more because we're not going to go in depth with all of these we don't have time to go in depth with all of these because they won't give us five more minutes 
If we had five more minutes, it wouldn't do us any good anyway. <laughs> but uh, be, beginning in chapter 10, we see these, I don't know if it's a dichotomy, what would it be? That these two opposites that are there that uh, uh, one says a positive thing and one says a negative thing. In Proverbs 10, 11, it says, The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but violence overwhelms the mouth of the wicked. Two verses later, it says, Wisdom is found on the lips of the discerning. The rod is for the back of him who lacks judgment. The next verse says, Wise men store up knowledge. With the mouth of the foolish, ruin is at hand. Verse 18 says, He who conceals his hatred has lying lips, but the one who split and, and the one who spreads slander is a fool. In verse 19, it says, When words are many, sin is not absent. You've all seen that, haven't you? Start saying too much and start running off at the mouth, and pretty soon we're in trouble. He who holds his tongue is wise. The tongue of the righteous is choice of silver. The heart of the wicked is of little value. The lips of the righteous nourish many, but a perverse tongue will be cut out. The lips of the righteous know what is fitting. The mouth of the wicked only what is perverse. Through knowledge the righteous escape. With his mouth, the godless destroys his neighbor. How many times do we underestimate the power of, of our words and the destruction that's caused by a little word or a few little words and the, and the irreparable damage that's caused by how we use our tongues? Through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. The mouth of the wicked is destroyed. The speech of the upright rescues them. The words of the wicked lie in wait for blood. The righteous man escapes trouble. The evil man is trapped by his sinful talk. Truthful witness gives honest testimony. A false witness tells lies. The tongue of the wise brings healing. Reckless words pierce like a sword. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only a moment. The Lord delights in men who are truthful. The Lord detests lying lips. Of those two, which would you rather be in? <laughs> would you rather be in A or B there? God delights in certain people, and he detests others, other actions. Word cheers him up, anxious heart weighs a man down. From the fruit of his lips, a man enjoys good things, but the unfaithful have a craving for violence. He who guards his lips guards his life. He who speaks rashly will come to ruin. But as I said, if we just focus on the, the negative use of the tongue and the mouth, we really don't get the message of the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs talks about mouths that speak things that are right. In other words, mouths that speak the truth. Proverbs 8 from verse 6 says, Listen, for I have worthy things to say. I open my lips to speak what is right. My mouth speaks what is true, for my lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just. None of them is crooked or perverse. To the discerning, all of them are right. They are faultless to those who have knowledge. Isn't that a beautiful description of our words and our mouths and our tongues and how they can be used if they speak what is right and if they speak the truth? Proverbs 16, 13 says, Kings take pleasure in honest lips. They value a man who speaks truth. Proverbs 14, 3 says, A fool's talk brings a rod to his back but the lips of the wise protect them. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. 
The tongue that brings healing is a tree of life, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. And so Proverbs also talks about a tongue that is wise and is used wisely. Don't you love the imagery in the book of Proverbs? The tongue that brings healing is a tree of life, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. I wish I would have said that. <laughs> Chapter 15, verse 7. The lips of the wise spread knowledge, not so the hearts of fools. And chapter 16, verse 23 says, A wise man's heart guides his mouth, and his lips promote instruction. And so as we've seen in, in some of those passages, Proverbs talks about lips and tongues that, that share knowledge, that impart knowledge. In Proverbs 20, verse 15, Gold there is and rubies in abundance, but the lips that speak knowledge are a rare jewel. And I don't want to embarrass the, the, the men who teach this class, but it is a jewel to be in this class. It is, a, it is like gold to be in this class and hear what they share with us uh, week after week after week. And the same thing is true about the men and women who teach the classes, other classes, about the men who preach on Sunday morning. We, re we really have a very, very rare gift. And whenever we're around people who are speaking, have lips that speak knowledge, true knowledge from the Bible, we need to appreciate that even more than we would gold or jewels or anything like that. Uh, it, we just need to appreciate that. And there are a lot of people out there who don't get that, and we need to appreciate that. Of course, the instruction about the use of our lips doesn't end with Proverbs or with the Old Testament. The New Testament has plenty to say about how we use lips. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, Peter quotes from the 34th Psalm. He says, Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. And so he echoes what the psalmist says and what the, the writer of Proverbs says, that we need to keep our lips from evil things and from deceitful speech. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6, Paul says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And so, you see how important it is not to keep our mouth shut? <laughs> the solution is not to tape your mouth shut. The solution is make sure that your speech is seasoned with salt, so that you'll know the right thing to say and the right way to use your tongue. Ephesians chapter 4 is, to me, the best description of what repentance really is. If you want to look there in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 23, Paul talks about renewing, being renewed in the spirit of our mind and putting on a new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness, of the truth. And then beginning in verse 25, we have, I think, the best example of, of what repentance is. Now, remember I've said that you can't not do something? <coughs> the only way that you can not do something is, is replace it with something positive. And so you can't just not do something, and you can't just keep your mouth closed. The only way to deal with the wrong kinds of speech is to replace them with the right kinds of speech. In verse 25, he says, Therefore, laying aside falsehoods, Speak truth to one another, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. Let him who steals steal no longer, but rather let him labor, performing with his own hands what is good, in order that he may have something to share with him who has need. And then in verse 29 he says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. According to verse 25, how do we get rid of lying? How do we get rid of falsehood? We get rid of falsehood by putting in the truth. As long as your mouth is speaking truth, you don't have to worry about speaking falsehood. And according to verse 29, 
if we want to get rid of those unwholesome words that come from our mouths, we replace it with words of encouragement, with words of edification, words that build each other up. And that's the only way we're going to get rid of the negative is by replacing it with the positive. In the parallel passage in Colossians chapter 3, he says, But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. You see, the New Testament is not silent about our, our lips either. There are many, many passages that sound like this that have a list of things that come out of our mouth. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech. And do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. But you do that by putting on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. And the only way to get rid of the bad stuff is replace it with good stuff. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 say, Put away all malice and deceit and, po and hypocrisy and envy and slander. So there again, there's, there's another list of things that we do with our mouths. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I think I've told you that, you're, that you people are strange. And some of the older translations says that you're peculiar people. And you folks are peculiar. It's not an insult. It's, an, it's a compliment. You people are just strange. You're peculiar because you're not like other people. You are unique, and that makes you peculiar, peculiar. And you've put aside these things from your mouth, but the only way to do it is to grow up in salvation and taste that the Lord is good. If your mouth is tasting how good the Lord is, it's kind of hard for that other stuff to come out. In fact, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 11, Jesus points out that it's not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth. This is what defiles the man. And he goes on and explains that in, in Matthew 15, 17 through 20. Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. And earlier in, in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said, either make the tree good or its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you're evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of, of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. That's scary, isn't it? That is really sobering to be told that we will give account for every careless word that we speak. As you walk around Lubbock or wherever you happen to be walking around, notice all the careless words that are being spoken, all of the empty words that are being spoken. And I'm sorry that those people don't understand that they're going to give account for those careless words, but we know better. And so we need to make sure that we, when we speak, it is the right kind of speech and it's not careless speak. It is, it is a little bit sobering for him to say, by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. And that's because Jesus has already pointed out that it comes from our heart. What comes out of our mouth is what we put in our heart to start with. In John chapter 8, Jesus is talking to some of the, his Jewish accusers. And he says, why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. 
you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them, because you are not of God. Where did lying come from? Satan invented it. Uh, and he turned it into an art form right from the beginning. Because he told Eve that God told them they couldn't eat of any of the trees. Which was a half truth, it was a whole lie. And then she corrected him and said, well, no, we can eat from all of them except that one. And then he said, well, if you eat that one, you're not going to die. And in fact, she didn't drop dead when she ate the fruit, but she did die. And so you see how Satan could use half-truths to, to speak a whole lie? Satan invented lying, and whenever we lie, we are simply serving Satan. God cannot lie. God does not lie. And those two are so far opposed that we can't even calculate how far apart they are. And so we either choose lying, which is of the devil, or we choose telling the truth, which is of God, and there's really no, no place in between. And when we're telling a lie, we need to make sure that we understand who we are serving at that time. Lest we misunderstand the critical nature of our tongue, in Revelation 21, 8, it says, For the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters. And we'd like to stop there. But it says, And all liars. Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Why is lying listed there with cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, immoral, sorcerers, and idolaters? Because liars are serving Satan. They're not serving God. And so we need to not take too lightly what we do with our tongues and, and how we, we speak. This, this concept goes throughout Paul's letters to Timothy. In 1 Timothy... In chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. As I urge you upon, upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus, in order that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering God's provision, which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men, straying from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. Verse 1 of chapter 2 gives the positive part of it, where he says, First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. In chapter 3, verse 8, in the qualifications of a deacon, he says, Deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued, nor addicted to much wine, nor fond of sordid gain. In verse 11, talking about perhaps deacons' wives, women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. In chapter 4, Paul says that the Spirit explicitly, explicitly says that in the later times, some will fall away from the truth, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods, which God has created to be gladly shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by means of the word of God and by prayer. Verse 13 
again, has a positive part of the discussion. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed upon you through the prophetic utterance made with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Uh, verse 13 says, Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. And then in 2 Timothy, in chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, Remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself to God, approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further uh, ungodliness. And the talk will spread like gangrene. Among, those are, among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and thus they upset the faith of some. In chapter 3, the first five verses, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, but men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding the form of, God, of godliness, although they have denied its power, and avoid such men as these. And then in chapter 4, verse 2, that says, Preach the Word. Preach the Word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. I hope the day never comes when we no longer say preach the word because as long as we are preaching the word, then we're using our lips for the right purpose and they will lead us in the right direction. James 1 says that if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own, tar his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. And Proverbs 24, 26 says, An honest answer is like a kiss on the lips. Another beautiful picture there. And this one did remind me of a psalm, and this is in Psalms, I think. <laughs> I think it is. The 85th Psalm that says, Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that, that glory may dwell in our land. Loving kindness and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. That's a whole sermon, folks, right there in one package. Isn't that a beautiful picture of how we use our lips? Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Truth springs from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. Indeed, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its produce. Righteousness will go before him and will make his footsteps into a way. Proverbs 25 tells us a gentle tongue can break a bone. And chapter 31 tells, says that faithful instruction is on her tongue. From the fruit of a man's, a, ma a mouth of a man's stomach is filled. With the harvest of his lip he's satisfied. But as Peter says in Colossians 3.17, Whatever we do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him through him to God the Father. And that brings us to the theme for the workshop. Because that's what it's all about. As I was, was thinking about what Proverbs tells us about the tongue, and as we were going through the workshop, this was the theme. So turn to Isaiah chapter 6. And I'm, I'm grateful that God helped me see the positive side of this. Not just talk about don't lie, don't do this, don't do that. Because that would not have been the message. And that would not have been the message that God wanted to share today. I think Isaiah chapter 6 is, is the message of how we use our tongue. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with a train of his robe filling the temple. The seraphim stood above him, each having six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet. 
and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundation of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with his tongs. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. Thank you, Gary. That's a lesson that all of us need to hear. We have several prayer requests. First, we have Ann Davis. She had a stroke and is in palliative, palliative care. Uh, we got Phyllis Cox, who is at Covenant, recovering from a stroke. Rita Gray had a fall and has some broken bones. Now, this is Philip. Is it Bodvar? I'm not sure how the last name on that is. Baldwin? Baldwin. Baldwin. Okay, Baldwin. Okay. Who has four stage, who's stage four cancer and is not doing well. We got Foy Boyer, is continued healing from chemo, and also Tanya Compest. And the problem she's had, Harry Overstreet has extreme back pain and is being followed by our doctor. Is there anything other than that on that, Cheryl? Okay. And then Jeanette C Cravey, she's in rehab from uh, hip replacement. Okay, Phyllis Cox had a stroke and also COVID, and she's in Covenant S481. Stuart Jones is going to have... A outpatient surgery on February the 9th at UMC, removal of two polyps from the ear and the eardrum repair. Wayne Clark has up upcoming heart surgery. And then Foy Boyer again, as far as continued prayers and strength and energy. Lita Sarton is healing and she's, uh, she's at home at this time. Also, Margaret Kenny or Kearney, uh, as you know, she had that, she was in that wreck and had broken ribs, and then she was hurting in her uh, uh, her pelvis, and when she had it checked, she had a crack in the pelvis, too, from that car wreck. So she's having quite a time recovering from that. Is it Romana Bright is struggling with breath and, and not feeling well? And then Denise Davis, and then Pat... And Dick, is it Ger Gerfirma? Gersima? Okay, Gersima. We need to repair and remember all of these in our prayers. And we'll turn it over to Kip at this time for the closing prayer. Oh, also, we need to stack the chairs this morning. Uh, they're having a, a dinner in here after the late service, so we need to get the chairs out of the way so they can get all set up for that. an appropriate lesson this morning. Did you listen to the crowd before class started? 
I don't know if it's the full moon or the fact that we missed most of the ice storm, but it's a, a very lively group. <laughs> Let's pray. We praise and honor your name, Father. We thank you for watching over us and protecting us. We thank you for all the many blessings that you shower upon us. From our perspective, Father, it looks like Satan is winning this country. Please fight the influence of him and his evil in our schools, in our churches, in our government. Thank you so much for this group that meets here. At this stage of our lives, we face many challenges. Sometimes it seems like every morning is a different hurt. There's a lot of folks here who have deep spiritual hurt mental hurt, physical pain. We pray, Father, with a thankful heart that you would grant us your peace and comfort and enable us to face out these years with courage and strength, knowing the reward that lies ahead of us. Thank you for your son. Thank you that he was willing to die for a sinner like me. In his name we pray, amen. 